everybody. I'm just going to make sure that I get the PowerPoint up. Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you so much for attending our session. Uh, my name is Erin Carney, and my three colleagues who are going to be presenting with me are Christelle Palpacuer Lee, uh, Teresa Catalano, and then Kristen Hoyt. So we'll be seeing three different uh, presenters after I'm through here. Um, we were very excited to see the um, call for papers for this fifth conference on um, intercultural competence. Um, the traditions, um, and I'm sorry, I'm flubbing it here a little bit, from traditions to transitions, because this is exactly the kind of moment that we felt we were in as teacher educators, so it felt very um, personal to us. We're going to be talking through our teacher educator voices there for today, but you'll hear that overlap as well with our researcher voices, so that's sort of what you're going to hear here today. So the title of our symposium, you've already seen the structure of our session. I've given these um, brief introductory remarks. You've heard a little bit about how we'll, how we'll proceed here. The work that I'm going to be sharing with you is um, having to do with modern and late modern tensions in the talk and work of language teacher educators. So I'm going to start with a little bit of theoretical framing, and that will help you to think about the brief glimpse into the empirical research that I'm going to show you. This is some research that I'm doing with Cristel, but I'm just going to draw from my own data set today from the teacher educator interviews that I conducted. And so this framing should also serve as um, an orienting kind of focus for the other presentations as well. So try to keep it in mind as we progress through the, the presentations. So I want to start by talking a little bit about um, what it is that's currently driving shifts in the ways that we think about language teacher education, specifically with regard to the way that language teacher education is a site for teacher learning about and around the development of um, intercultural competence and symbolic competence. I draw heavily on Claire Cromch's work, which is why I also include that. Um, so this is something that's been taken up quite um, substantively in the 2014 issue of the Modern Language Journal that Claire Crumpsch edited, and I'm going to introduce you to some of the concepts that she talks about in the introductory piece to that volume. Essentially, what she's arguing in the opening piece, and I'm going to quote um, a little bit extensively here, uh, through its mobility of people and capital, its global technologies, and its global information networks, globalization has changed the conditions under which foreign languages are taught, learned, and used. It has destabilized, she continues, the codes, norms, and conventions that foreign language educators have relied upon to help learners be successful users of the language once they had left their classrooms. These changes call for a more reflective, interpretive, historically grounded, and politically engaged pedagogy than was called for by the communicative language teaching of the 80s. So we might linger on any number of the shifts that globalization has brought to bear on language teacher education. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight two main points that I want you to keep in mind as we go on. First, uh, globalization has prompted new formulations of fundamental foundational sorts of concepts uh, in the practice and conceptualization of foreign language education and language teacher education. So here I'm talking about language, culture, communication, teaching, and learning pretty important stuff, right? And these things are becoming um, differently meaningful to us in an age of globalization. Uh, the other point here is that these, um, these important concepts can be located on an um, axis that can be characterized as belonging to a modernist tradition and moving toward a postmodernist tradition. So when we think about these things, that's how we can uh, sort of renew our thinking about foundational concepts. So second main point, languages and cultures and the competences that we identify as worthwhile in pursuing in languages education, so whether this be intercultural competence, symbolic competence, um, and really communicative competence, ling linguistic proficiency, all of those things that we hope for, we are now increasingly seeing these in light of their semiotic uh, dimensions. So um, what I mean to say here is that what we often refer to as language learning, 
is not only viewed as acquisition of forms, functions, and meanings, and gaining facility with communicative routines and situations, so meaning making in that sense, um, but also seen as a complex, emergent, and contingent, non-neutral process of meaning making. So she talks a lot about um, manipulating signs, right? the ability to um, gain potential and agency as a language user through the ability to manipulate semiotic resources. Um, so I guess as a corollary, language teaching and language teacher education then also has to be ready, cognizant of those shifts, ready to deal with them and ready to foster them. Okay, uh, I've reproduced a, a chart from Angela Scarino's contribution to that same volume where she goes into great depth about this movement from what we might call the sort of concrete ideas about language, culture, learning, um, maybe the more solid approaches, if we borrow from Fred Durbin's talk yesterday, toward the more fluid, hybrid, um, social practice, socially semiotic versions of those terms. Um, I'm not going to linger too much here, except to say that we've seen some of these shifts occurring already in the field, both in scholarly dimensions and in the dimensions of practice. So I'm thinking, if you went to Glenn Levine's talk yesterday, uh, he made reference to the same sorts of um, frameworks that I do. Um, Heidi Burns and her colleagues work on genre-based approach to languages education, and then um, any type of multi-literacies-oriented or semiotically grounded approach. So Beatrice Dupri's work, uh, Kristen Michelson, Melanie Perron, who's here with us in the room, and Beatrice too, uh, and Kristen too, so <laughs> glad you're all here. Uh, so these are the types of pr approaches, and also Swaffer and Aaron. So we've seen this sort of approach that's very semiotically oriented, right? So we see this happening in some scales, mostly at the collegiate level, though. Um, so I've reproduced as well the axes that, um, that Claire Kromsch has uh, brought up in this 2014. She's adapt I've adapted hers a little bit. She's adapted them from Blomert and colleagues from 2012, who adapted them from Foucault. Okay, so there's a bit, little bit of a lineage here. Um, so in a modernist, more traditional view of the enterprise of language education in all forms. Um, we might tend more towards a purity and authenticity sort of view of language and culture and their interrelationship, uh, or we might tend in the other direction towards cultural hybridity, postmodern view. We might tend towards order and stability, or um, see things as more interconnected, so when we talk about the relationships of language and culture, uh, or languages and cultures, I should say, and their dynamic properties. Uh, we might view um, the sort of normalcy of linguistic forms or the standardization and talk about correctness, accuracy, appropriateness. Uh, or we might sort of go to the other end, so, sort of see um, increased diversity, uh, fluidity, fl flexibility when we think about um, these foundational concepts. And um, Claire Kromsch has added as the, um, this, what is it, the fourth dimension here, this fourth axis of um, seeing language learning for its use value, so a communicative approach, for example, um, sees language as useful because we can use it to communicate, right? Um, and she says a postmodern view sort of tends more um, to seeing language learning as an exchange value. So we can think in terms of the commodifications of languages and also the symbolic values um, and symbolic capital that can come along uh, with languages and cultures. Okay, so really briefly through this study, um, I conducted an interview case study of eight teacher educators in New York State. This was a convenience sample, and my initial goals were purely personal, professional. I was trying to learn how to become a teacher educator seven years ago, so I interviewed a bunch of teacher educators in the same context I was working in. Uh, as the years went by, I started to see another possible goal that could be pursued with this small data set, um, and that was to start looking at the ways the teacher educators had described their approach to addressing culture in language teaching and how they were trying to prepare their teacher candidates for those dimensions of their work. Um, so I was looking in a different kind of direction, guided by these two research questions that you have here. I won't uh, give you the, the, um, the details of the analytic process, but there were multiple layers of coding. Um, I was, uh, and you'll see some of the evidence of that in the next slide. Uh, I was looking at whether they were talking about their philosophies or their practices or reported practices and any overlap there. I was looking for um, recurrent statements about 
uh, what it is that they thought and did. And I was looking at that uh, across interviews, within interviews. Um, what I found was there's there was a lot of, um, I've been calling them refrains, and I think maybe the catechism term from yesterday is appropriate. Uh, so there were some um, very strong refrains. Um, and as I went back to look beyond what they were saying, to look at how they were saying it as an initial analytic step, I started to also notice a lot of discontinuities in what they were saying. And when the 2014 piece came out and I started reading about modernist and postmodernist um, theories and how they were, these tensions affecting the, the field, uh, it seemed like a good expl explanatory framework for the discontinuities that I was seeing. So now I'm going to show you the sort of um, the refrains, and then I'm going to show you some specific pieces of data to illustrate the discontinuities. Um, so there were several statements. I'm not going to go through them all. I've tried to highlight in, in orange here things to help um, to help point out the important pieces. Everybody agreed culture is important, has a role in language teaching and language teacher education. Um, there were um, quite a few references to the goals of culture, te te of, uh, culture teaching being about the dispelling and debunking of stereotypes. And most of the time, the idea was to then supplant these with a more accurate, true, real picture of the culture. Okay, So these two things were always kind of accompanying each other. There was some talk about social justice, quite vague. Um, the identification of culture as a skill, things that we've seen in the literature before. Um, there was um, a lot of defining culture in national terms. Again, another trend we've seen. The interesting, one of the interesting pieces here, uh, and the most recurrent refrain, uh, had to do with um, language and culture being inseparable, another one that we hear quite often uh, as teacher educators, um, and that because they're inseparable, culture must be integrated into language teaching. So that term integration comes up incessantly, uh, and to such an extent uh, for some of the teacher candidates that they had their um, teacher candidates report or in to integrate in culture every lesson plan, every day. Um, so. Uh, these were kind of the, the two that occurred the most. So I had eight participants. Six out of the eight explicitly mentioned these things, and I would say the other two implicitly refer to these discourses. Okay, so these were the refrains. Now here are some tensions. I'm just going to give you two. So in this first uh, excerpt, our first teacher educator, I asked her about whether she thought her, um, her students, her teacher candidates, had culture on their radar when they arrived in her methods class. And she said, it's on their radar, but in a very superficial way. They're not thinking of culture in terms of teaching for social justice, which we never got around, despite all my probing, to defining in a, in a clear kind of way. Um, that you have an obligation to teach your students to dispel stereotypes to teaching history about Christopher Columbus, for example. And then she goes on a bit later in the same, the same uh, stretch of talk. I caution them all the time that they cannot be complicit in the perpetuation of these stereotypes that Americans have and give them a true picture of what it's really like in France. Does everybody go around with a beret and a baguette? Uh, and to really know the face of France the way it really is. Okay, So I've uh, put in orange here and in white the sort of modern and postmodern tendencies. So you'll see that in the, the next slide as well. Um, so uh, while on the one hand, she's sort of um, expressing a concern for going deeper, escaping superficiality, the sorts of things that kind of tend toward postmodernist views. Uh, she follows them up right away with very modernist traditions about uh, language and culture and that being mono, them being monolithic, identifiable, compartmentalized things, right? A uh, second example, oh no, forgot to say something important here. So what's the tension of, according to that? Uh, scale I initially showed you, you have sort of this purity, authenticity dimension versus the complexity, dynamism dimension. Uh, in this second little snippet, um, the tension that's in play has more to do with um, order, stability, monolith versus interconnection and dynamism. So here, uh, two different teacher educators are talking about um, how culture and language operates. So they they assert that they're inseparable, right? They're interconnected, postmodernist. Um, and then they go on to explain how they're related, and they're not really integrated at all, right? So in one example, um, 
culture is the thing that motivates students at the start of a lesson, and then you can do the language piece, which is the main attraction. Okay? So they're not really integrated. Um, so they're sort of following up their explanations indicate that um, this inseparability isn't really happening in practice. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Uh, there's quite a heavy reliance, even though my data set is quite small. I think it's suggestive, and I think it resonates if you've uh, been talking with anybody in the profession, right? That um, there's a heavy reliance on traditional modernist refrains, uh, and at the same time, there are these moments of contradiction where we can start to see the tensions arising between the modernist and the postmodern conceptions of these really fundamental concepts of language communication, culture, teaching, and learning. So I've started to think of this process in the presence of the tensions as a kind of grappling and a potentially productive grappling that we can work with. Um, so the teacher educators are quite understandably um, producing these, um, they're quick to produce these sort of traditional refrains. They've been socialized into them pretty pretty deeply, right? And absent any other alternatives, they will continue to produce them. At the same time, they're faced with the realities of globalization as they, they try to plan for their classes, try to prepare their students for teaching. But if these things aren't addressed, we're going to keep getting further and further away from the goals that we purport to have for language teaching and language education. So there's a lot of talk of global skills, world readiness, for example. But if these things aren't dealt with substantively, we get further and further away from actually being able to achieve what it is we're trying to achieve. So what do we do? Well, we don't know exactly, but we wanted to start talking about it, which is why we organized this symposium. So what we're thinking, at least as um, one um, starting point, is that we can talk explicitly about what our goals are, and a lot of this conference is about expanding what it is we mean, elaborating, clarifying, questioning what it is we mean when we talk about intercultural competence. A lot of people have been focusing on, is it the cultural, is it the inter, is it what should we be focusing on, how can we be having these conversations? Um, the global competence term is especially one that deserves a lot of attention. Um, it's being used in perhaps an empty way, uh, that, uh, the way that uh, Fred was talking about it yesterday. I'm referring to him as if we are personal acquaintances. We are not. <laughs> I didn't. I, I met him on a golf cart. It's the first night here. Um, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't recognize him because I was tired. Otherwise, he would not have gotten to sleep as early. I don't think I would have wanted to talk about this stuff. Um, so. Uh, there's all these sort of foundational constructs that we need to be talking about in the profession, but also in our teacher education classes, right? So we need to be thinking about what sort of messages are we sending as teacher educators about what language is, just not by what we say, but also how we talk about how you teach language and approach language and culture. Um, we also need a range of curricular, pedagogical, and language teacher education processes that align with this kind of orientation. So we need to get into some grappling, I think, and that's a good thing. What you're um, going to see in the subsequent, subsequent papers are um, some ways that we're suggesting and some ways that we're using as teacher educators to, to have more um, discussions with our future teachers about um, meaning-based approaches, uh, semiotically informed approaches uh, to language teacher education. And we are offering some of these questions as uh, possible points of departure for our discussion later, and uh, we'll, we'll bring the slide back up. Uh, so what kinds of practices are most compat compatible with a late modern meaning-oriented approach to languages education? How might we effectively build a repertoire of teacher education practices that stress the centrality of meaning in developing intercultural, symbolic, and perhaps global competences? And how do we know that our meaning-based approaches to developing interculturality in teacher education are effective or not? What evidence permit these kinds of claims about whether our work has worked? Okay, I am surprisingly under time, never happened. Um, I'm ready, <laughs> I think I'm ready. I actually caught a slide this morning because I thought I was going over. Uh, so I'm ready to welcome your questions and comments for about five minutes. Okay, great, thank you.